but with that said, I want to welcome everyone to the RISE Learning Machines Seminars. RISE is the Research Institute of Sweden, uh, and we have nearly 3,000 uh, people working on a wide array of topics. And this learning machine is part of the computer science department, which works on applied AI projects for the benefit of society. So, yeah, with that said, uh, I want to just introduce today's speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Virginia Smith, uh, associate professor at CMU. And prior to CMU, Virginia has uh, been a postdoc at Stanford University and received a PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley. And her research spans machine learning, optimization, and distributed systems. And the topic of today's talk will be evaluating large-scale learning systems. And with that said, uh, Virginia, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks so much for um, having me here in the... <laughs> In the virtual seminar, I'm really looking forward to speaking with you all today. Um, and please stop me at any point. I don't know if you have a protocol for this, but you know you can just interrupt me if you're able to unmute yourself or put something in the chat window. I would love to make this more interactive. So if you have questions or anything's unclear um, or want to discuss a you know part of the the talk, I would love to to stop and and have a discussion. Um, so. As was mentioned, I'm going to be talking about uh, evaluating large-scale learning systems today. The first part of the talk will be more focused on federated learning systems, and that, then I'm going to talk more broadly about large-scale machine learning systems, specifically focusing on large language models. Um, so some of the emerging challenges around evaluation with large language models. Before I get into the talk material, I, I wanted to also just provide a little bit of additional background into who I am and some of the research in my lab. Uh, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the first part of the talk will be on federated learning. This has been a major research focus in my group for the last several years. And one of the key motivations for federated learning is, you know, very simply, if you're thinking about exciting applications of machine learning, maybe you're thinking about, you know, these language models or applications like you know, these chatbots or voice recognition on phones, things like machine learning for healthcare or smart homes or smart cities. Crucially, all of these applications of machine learning rely on some data. Uh, and this data is not coming from just a single person speaking or writing text. It's not coming often from just a single patient or a single hospital. And it's not coming from just a single sensor. It's coming from entire networks of phones, maybe multiple organizations, multiple hospitals, and split across entire sensor networks. And the idea in federated learning, very simply, is to take advantage of the fact that we have this network increasingly with growing computational capabilities at the edge. So rather than sending all of the raw data that's being generated on phones or across these organizations or on these sensors, to some central location. In federated learning, the idea very simply is to keep the data at the edge and to move as much of the computation of the machine learning workflow to the edge as possible. So there are many possible advantages of this. This can help to reduce strain on the network. So rather than moving all of that raw data, you can keep more data at the edge and this can help to reduce some of the network traffic and the amount of communication across the network. This can also allow you to more quickly incorporate data that you're seeing at the edge and there can be privacy advantages of this. By no means does keeping the raw data alone provide a rigorous notion of privacy, but you can incorporate other privacy and security mechanisms on top of this to help to improve the privacy and security advantages overall. Okay, so this is one of the reasons that there's been a lot of excitement around the area of federated learning in the last several years. Um, and over the last several years, my group at Carnegie Mellon has been focused on developing foundational tools for the field of federated learning. So this has involved developing techniques for efficient distributed learning and optimization, specifically dealing with the issue of heterogeneity in federated settings. So the idea that data might differ from one device or one organization to another. And this heterogeneity can appear not just in terms of the underlying data, but also in terms of the systems capabilities of the devices themselves. So for example, someone might have a new phone that's 
she has great you know, network connection. These things can affect how capable each of these devices are at participating in the training process. Okay, and finally, this is not unique to federated learning, but a lot of the focus uh, has been specifically on providing these guarantees around more trustworthy machine learning. So improving things like privacy and robustness and fairness in the context of federated learning, but also in machine learning more generally. The tools we've developed have been deployed at places like Google and Meta for learning across massive networks of mobile phone users. We've worked with partners at Symantec to develop tools for smart home anomaly detection. Um, and more recently, we, we recently won this Privacy Enhancing Technologies Prize Challenge. So the focus here was developing tools for privacy preserving pandemic forecasting across multiple hospitals. Okay, so this is more of an application of this area of cross silo federated learning. So learning across a smaller number of organizations. We've also had a major focus on developing tools that are open source and developing resources for the federated learning community. So we've developed methods that are you know, deployed in an open source fashion in common federated learning libraries like TensorFlow Federated, FLSIM, which is from Meta and Flower. We've also developed our own benchmarks like the LEAF benchmark, which is commonly used for federated learning. Um, and I'm one of the co-organizers of this flow seminar. I wanted to mention this briefly at the beginning of the seminar. Um, just if you're interested in the area of federated learning, this is a seminar that we started during the pandemic. It takes place roughly once a week on Wednesdays, uh, and it's a worldwide seminar open to the public, it takes place over Zoom. Uh, so if you're interested in, in federated learning, we'd love to have you, uh, you know, come and participate in the, the seminar. All right. So that's kind of motivation for some of the broad work in my group. I want to motivate now what I'll be talking about specifically in this talk. And the key motivation for thinking about evaluation specifically is that if you think of sort of the machine learning pipeline, right, you start with some raw data, you maybe do some data pre-processing, you plug all of that pre-processed data potentially into some training scheme that produces a model, you evaluate how good that model is, and maybe you perform some post-processing. Right, maybe there's some iteration happening here on evaluation and training. You might do some compression of the model after the fact. And eventually this yields you know, some deployed model that you can use for your machine learning application. Now we've seen some interesting trends over the last you know, decade or so. So for a long time, there was a major, even though we present this as a roughly sort of equal partitioning of the pipeline, in reality, there was a ton of time spent on data pre-processing, right? We spent a lot of time and we still do on you know, finding data, labeling data, cleaning data. Um, with the rise of deep learning, you could argue maybe that more of the computational power at least was focused on the training component, right? So we went from maybe you know, developing features for our data to using deep learning and related techniques to learn these representations. Uh, so more of the emphasis was on this training component. Now what we're seeing with the rise of large language models that, and you know, related foundation models pre-training, the idea is that we can hopefully leverage these very powerful expressive models to avoid some of this you know, data pre-processing and training but now the emphasis is on evaluation, right? How do these models actually work? Do they work well for the particular task we have in mind? And specifically, are there ways that we can adapt the model so it works well for the particular task at hand? Okay, so a lot of the emphasis now may be moving towards these issues of evaluation and, and post-processing, which have always been very important issues. I'm just highlighting the fact that, you know, sort of the, the goal of these pre-trained models, foundation models, is ideally to remove some of the emphasis on the efforts around data pre-processing and training. <clears throat> okay, um, of course, though, these, these have, you know, particular scenarios of evaluation and post-processing, not only are they, you know, sort of magnified relative to the other components of the workflow, but what we're seeing is that there are some unique concerns that arise with evaluation and post-processing. So there's now some new challenges that exist in terms of effectively performing these components of the pipeline. And this is what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk about 
two ways that evaluating large-scale learning systems can be particularly challenging and some techniques that we've been developing to make this process a little bit more uh, effective. So the first part of the talk, I'll be looking at the problem of evaluation in federated networks. So thinking about um, some of the applications that I mentioned previously, so specifically learning over very large federated networks of, say, mobile phones, wearable devices, um, and some of the unique challenges that exist when performing evaluation of models that are trained in these settings. And then I'm going to talk about some techniques for improving the evaluation of large language models. And again, please stop me at, at any point if you... Uh, if you have any questions. All right, so let me first start uh, by talking about the problem of evaluation in federated networks. And what we're specifically going to do in this work is think about evaluation in the context of hyperparameter tuning, right? So evaluation is a key component of selecting good hyperparameters, right? We select which hyperparameters to use for training or for the model based on some evaluation sig signals, some validation signal that we have. Um, and we're going to talk uh, about in this work how this problem of the fact that evaluation can be very challenging, can be very noisy in federated settings, it turns out that this can significantly impact this process of hyperparameter tuning. And this is some work with partners, uh, collaborators, both at Carnegie Mellon and also some folks from the federated learning team at Meta. So I wanted to mention before I dive into the, this component of the, the talk that I'm gonna specifically be looking at applications of cross-device federated learning. Um, and by this, I mean learning across very large networks of devices, um, could be a network of, of mobile phones, or as I mentioned, a network of wearable devices. Um, but specifically, I'm going to be thinking about scenarios where the scale is very, very large, and each of the devices in the network maybe hold only a small amount of data. So this is something that's a little bit of a distinct setting from one of the applications I mentioned earlier, learning across hospitals, where there, there might be only you know, a handful of hospitals or organizations that you're learning over. In the cross-device setting, there's usually something like hundreds to thousands to, to millions of devices that you're learning over. And in this setting, in the setting of cross-device federated learning, the training and evaluation workflow typically looks like this. So you have some set of training clients. So some subset of the clients are used for training. And then you, you're training, you know, at each iteration, a model on these clients. You then produce a trained model and you evaluate that model on a separate set of validation clients. So why is this done? This is done for a few reasons. One is that typically in these cross-device settings, you have little control over actually indexing into specific clients. Uh, one reason for this is for privacy and security reasons. We don't want to maintain identifiers of the specific clients that are used during training or evaluation. The second reason, though, is just that these networks are very unreliable. So you might try to communicate with a set of clients or a set of devices, and for whatever reason, you know, someone turns their phone off, their phone's not connected to a power source. Uh, you know, very, various constraints on this system, you might not actually hear back information from a particular client. And so for this reason, what you typically think about doing to perform training and evaluation is that you have some random pool of clients that you're using for training and you have some other pool that you're using for validation, but you also know that you might only actually get information from a subset of both that training or validation pool. And this is, again, just to, just to highlight the point, you're not going to be able to do sort of the typical thing of splitting uh, every client into a training and validation set for that particular client. So you're splitting this based on the actual clients themselves. And it's worth mentioning that this also sort of makes sense from a statistical point of view, in the sense that if you imagine having a network of millions of devices, that's sort of the underlying population of interest, right? Um, when you're performing training, you're only going to see a subset of those clients. So you can think about there being really two distributions of interest, the distribution of, of clients that you're trying to, to model via some subsample and the distribution of data on those clients. 
And splitting training and validation in this manner helps to mimic the fact that we're trying to model this underlying pool of clients, right? So we're splitting into training clients and validation clients. Okay, um, so this is the typical workflow in cross-device settings. Um, and one issue with, with this sort of setting, as with all you know, applications of machine learning, is that to get these models working well, right? You might have to set a number of hyperparameters, right? So, okay, traditionally in machine learning, there you're going to be considering these hyperparameters as well. There might be some regularization that you're considering. For the optimization method, there could be a host of different hyperparameters, right? So, for example, maybe you're running an adaptive optimization method like Atom. There might be a learning rate, and there might be some hyperparameters related to the momentum terms, for example. Federated learning makes this only worse in the sense that there is a bunch of hyperparameters that might be introduced for you know, specific federated optimization methods. And one very simple way that you see this appearing is that you can view what's happening in these federated optimization methods as there being sort of two layers of optimization. There's what's happening at the server where, for example, you might be running something like Atom uh, at, at a more macro level. And then there's the training that's happening on each of the clients. So you might have, for example, a server-specific learning rate, some Atom-specific hyperparameters at the server, but then you also have client-specific hyperparameters. You might have a client-specific learning rate and a batch size specific to each of the, you know, each to the clients in the network. And so these are all things that must be tuned. I would say, you know, this subset of hyperparameters, this is what we looked at in the work I'll be talking about today. I think this is a pretty minimal set. So in practice, this might be significantly worse depending on what optimization methods you're looking at and whether you're also considering any hyperparameters related to the, the objective itself, related to how you're performing modeling. Okay, um, so there's a bunch of hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are critical for the success, not just of federated learning, of machine learning more generally. But the pro the, this problem of selecting these hyperparameters can be very difficult. And the reason that this can be very difficult is that evaluation is hard in federated settings. The reason that it's hard is that there's a bunch of ways that these evaluation signals can be quite noisy. So one way is the issue that I alluded to earlier. We're only seeing a subset of the clients or devices when we're trying to perform evaluation, right? We're not seeing the entire network of clients. We can't possibly communicate with a million phones, for example. Um, so we're subsampling the clients to perform evaluation due to issues around communication and network scale. Additionally, this is a, one of the points that I mentioned earlier that we've been focusing on in, in my lab, you have this issue of heterogeneity that pops up in federated settings. And again, this can you know, be a result of both the data and the underlying systems. So there might be differences in the data from one client to another, right? For the application of language modeling, people might speak slightly differently. Their voices might sound slightly different. They might use language in a different manner. So all of these can affect how the data distributions look from one client to another. And these differences, again, they show up not just in terms of the data, but in terms of the underlying systems. So for example, because certain devices themselves might be different, certain devices might be more capable of participating in training or evaluation, right? And so this can also introduce additional biases in terms of the actual data or the clients that are participating and that we have access to. And finally, and I think this is something that people don't often think about in the context of federated evaluation, we talk about privacy a lot in the context of training, but privacy also matters in terms of computing these evaluation signals. So we also care about things like differential privacy in terms of, you know, figuring out what the evaluate, you know, modeling, developing a model and deploying that model and evaluating it across different clients. Um, so this is something that I think, especially in research settings, when people are thinking about evaluating new federated learning methods, they're often not thinking about or incorporating this aspect of privacy in terms of running those experiments. But this is something that you care about in practice. So in practice, you care about not just incorporating differential privacy in terms of performing training, but also in terms of when you're performing evaluation. And just like with training, this is also an area that can you know, introduce a lot of noise in the final signal that you get. So the broad question that we wanted to ask in this work 
uh, you know, again, we're focused generally on this issue of evaluation. How does evaluation differ in federated settings from other sort of machine learning workflows? But specifically, what we're looking at in this work is how does this issue of noisy evaluation affect this you know, ubiquitous process of hyperparameter tuning, this process that you're going to need to do. And in fact, there's going to be many additional hyperparameters introduced in the context of federated systems. And just to give you an example of why this can be problematic, let's say that you, uh, you know, you have multiple configurations that you're trying to evaluate from a pool of clients. Let's say that you had access to the entire pool of clients. You might, you know, take a very, you know, certain configurations and evaluate them on the clients, and you would see that certain configurations would perform better than others, right? If you had access to all of the clients, what you could then do is aggregate all of these evaluations at the server, and you would see, you know, maybe via some voting scheme that one of these configurations, in this case, the green configuration, right, this set of hyperparameters seems to perform the best on average for all of the clients. Okay. What happens though in federated settings is one, you don't have access to the full client pool. Additionally, some of the clients might drop out, right? For reasons that I mentioned earlier, someone might turn their phone off. Someone might not have, you know, a full battery or connection to power, or they might just have poor network connection. Um, all of these things can affect whether or not these clients can actually send us back an evaluation signal. So we have this issue of client subsampling, right? We're not hearing back from all of the clients in our pool. Um, and again, issues of heterogeneity of the fact that, you know, this is not a perfectly IID sample, right? This can exacerbate some of these issues of subsampling. Additionally, we're gonna add some noise, right? To preserve differential privacy. So what we see now is that even though originally when we had access to the entire client pool, it looked like this green configuration was the best. Now, when we perform this, you know, aggregate ranking, we might see incorrectly that this red configuration is the best. So this is just an illustration of why things might go wrong, right? We don't have access to the entire client pool for evaluation. We have additional sources of heterogeneity that lead to further subsampling and exacerbate some of these issues of subsampling. And then we're adding noise, which can, you know, obscure some of these results even further. Okay, um, so what we're going to do in this work is think about this issue, think about these potential sources of noise, and see how problematic they might actually be in practice. In particular, the, the workflow that we set up is that we looked at four commonly used federated or four commonly used hyperparameter tuning methods. These are uh, methods that are very commonly used in non-federated settings. Random search, that's probably the baseline that everyone's familiar with. Um, TPE, this is a very common Bayesian optimization method. So what Bayesian optimization methods are trying to do at a high level is perform some adaptation in terms of selecting the best hyperparameter configuration. So for example, you might have sort of this heat map that's identifying good you know, portions of the hyperparameter space. And what you're doing is taking advantage of the fact that you realize that some areas of this space have been more effective than others, right? So you can, can think about sampling can, possible configurations in, in an adaptive manner. There's also hyperband. This is another uh, very commonly used approach in non-federated settings. You can think about this as also being an adaptive method, but where you're adaptively allocating resources to potential configurations. So configurations that seem to be more effective in terms of, you know, reducing the, the loss or the validation signal, um, you can see that, you know, those are ones that you might want to allocate more resources to relative to configurations that seem from the, from the start to be not performing very well. Okay, and then there's Bob. This is sort of the best of both worlds, potentially. So this is a combination of TPE and hyperband. So again, these are, you know, commonly used, very effective methods in non-federated settings. What we did was first, I'll note that kind of deploying these in federated settings is pretty simple in that what we're really testing in this work is whether we can use these hyperparameter tuning methods with this sort of wrapper, which is that we're performing federated evaluation in order to get signal for these hyperparameter tuning methods. 
So specifically what we're going to look at is what happens when this evaluation signal that's coming from these federated clients is potentially noisy due to these issues of subsampling, heterogeneity, and privacy. Okay, so our, our experiments are going to look at trying to implement these hyperparameter tuning methods in federated settings. We don't actually have to change the hyperparameter methods at all. What we're changing is simply that the signal that we're feeding to these hyperparameter tuning methods is potentially noisy because we're performing federated evaluation. Okay, so the questions that we ask in this work in particular um, mirror some of these challenges that I mentioned. So the first question is, we just wanted to understand how does this issue of subsampling the validation clients? How does this, you know, affect the evaluation signal? And in particular, how does it affect the performance of hyperparameter tuning methods? We then wanted to see how these other factors possibly interact with or exacerbate the issue of subsampling. So how does this, this issue of data heterogeneity, systems heterogeneity, and privacy, how do these issues potentially, uh, you know, make this issue of subsampling worse? Okay, and in particular, one of the, the key things we wanted to do to sort of measure the overall effect of noise is we wanted to understand how some of these state-of-the-art methods, so TPE, hyperband, and Bob, which typically outperform something like random search by a very large margin in non-federated settings, we wanted to understand how these methods perform to the simple baseline of random search in light of this noisy evaluation. And maybe you see where I'm going with this. I'll just give you the punchline really quickly and then we'll get into the details. So surprisingly, well, first of all, we find that these issues that affect the evaluation signal tend to have a very large impact on the hyperparameter tuning performance. So we see that subsampling, heterogeneity, and privacy can all significantly impact this, this problem of hyperparameter tuning. And one of the key takeaways here is that we see in particular that because this can be so problematic, these methods, these state-of-the-art methods from non-federated settings can perform quite poorly, even worse than you know, very simple baselines like random search. And the reason that I think this is so important to point out is that typically people, when they're performing research in federated learning, are not really thinking about this problem of federated evaluation. So they often develop methods for federated learning, and then they maybe evaluate them on the entire client pool or on a client pool where they're not you know, thinking about these issues of subsampling or privacy, for example. And the concern is that we're developing methods that are not going to translate to practical use in the sense that we could be you know, selecting hyperparameters or developing methods that don't reflect this issue of noisy evaluation. And what we've seen is just for this very simple process of hyperparameter tuning and thinking about which methods are best for hyperparameter tuning, this issue of noisy evaluation can have a really significant impact on sort of which methods perform better than other methods. Okay. Can I ask a question there? Yeah. So in like centralized typical machine learning, we usually assume that the training set and the test set comes from the same underlying data distributions, right? Can yes. you give some type of reflection here in the federated case? You've talked a bit about uh, non-IID data and how you split the clients between training and validation, but I assume you also test in some test case in the end in order to evaluate your hyperparameters and just reflect a bit about how does the test set, uh, the distribution of the test set with the test clients, for example, do, do we have a different distribution there compared to the training and why in that case? Yeah, that's a great point. So the, the underlying assumption in cross device settings is that you have a, what you're trying, the population you're trying to measure is the population of clients or devices that are participating. So mirroring what you would do in centralized settings, you then split your data or your you know, your pool, your population into three components. So you have your training clients, your validation clients, and I didn't mention this, but you have a separate set of test or inference clients. And this mirrors sort of the way that the workflow, the machine learning workflow works in federated settings, which is that you perform some training on subset, some subset of clients. And eventually at the end of the day, you're going to deploy this across all of the clients, right? So this is going to be a model that's deployed uh, across the entire network. Um, so this mirrors sort of 
you know, what's happening in centralized settings where you have a small population of training data that's trying to reflect the overall, you know, all of the underlying population of data. Um, the thing that I'm pointing out here is simply that the, you know, the granularity of this is typically at the client level or the device level mm. where each of the devices may themselves have some distribution of data. All right. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right. So, um, and please stop me. Yes, I I would love to stop for questions. So if anyone else has, has questions, please let me know. Um, so this is the this is the high level goal of of this you know portion of the talk and and of uh, this research. We wanted to understand how this noisy evaluation signal can potentially affect these hyperparameter tuning methods. Um, so here's some high level details I mentioned earlier. We're looking at actually a fairly small hyperparameter search space. So we're looking at using Atom at the server and then just running stochastic gradient descent at the client with some learning rate and batch size. And we're looking at some common data sets for federated learning. These are data sets that appear in this leaf benchmark that I mentioned. Um, so we're looking at some image data sets, CIFAR-10 and FEMNIST. This is a federated version of the extended MNIST data set. Um, and we're looking at Stack Overflow on Reddit. So these are two um, language modeling tasks. <clears throat> um, so let's just get dive into kind of this first issue of subsampling. So You'll see here, by the way, all of the plots I'll be showing look roughly similar today. So on the y-axis, we have the validation error. And so we want this to be small. On the x-axis, we're gonna have some measure of this issue of subsampling or heterogeneity or privacy. And so what you're seeing here in this plot is for this particular data set, the CIFAR-10 data set, what we're looking at is relative to the best possible set of hyperparameters and what the corresponding validation error would be in terms of those hyperparameters, we're seeing how this problem of subsampling affects the results of random search. And I think this is pretty intuitive. Basically, if you had access to the full validation pool, you would arrive at a set of hyperparameters that is pretty decent. Maybe it doesn't exactly match, match the best hyperparameters because we're using random search. So there's some variance here. Um, but the you know, sort of average result that you would get from using random search is, is not you know, so far off from the best set of hyperparameters. What happens though, is that as you start to reduce the number of clients that you have access to, right? Because you're performing subsampling, which is very common in federated settings due to the scale of the network and these issues around systems heterogeneity, you start to see the performance starting to deteriorate. So we're you know, seeing results on average that are worse in terms of identifying the best hyperparameters, and you're seeing a lot more variance in terms of the results. Okay, And this is something that we see across the board in terms of all of the data sets. So this is the same results just plotted across various data sets. Um, and uh, you know, again, y-axis is the validation error. We're seeing that as we start to do more subsampling, the validation error starts to decrease. Or sorry, the validation error starts to increase. So we're getting worse validation error as we're performing more subsampling. Okay, and these numbers may seem pretty low, but recall that, you know, in terms of this being 1% or less of the total population that we're looking at, but remember that in a network of, say, a million of devices, this is maybe not such an unrealistically low percentage of clients that we're looking at. Okay. Um, again, I think this is an intuitive set of results here in terms of this issue of heterogeneity, uh, which is that we're performing subsampling. Um, so so again, subsampling is sort of on there. We're seeing a smaller and smaller population of the clients for validation. But then we look at data that is more or less heterogeneous in terms of the partitioning. And what you can see is that as data be becomes more identically distributed, this issue of subsampling is less of an issue. But as it becomes more heterogeneous, we start to see that subsampling affects the results more significantly. Okay, and this is something that we see, again, across all of the data sets. Basically, this issue of heterogeneity exacerbates this issue of subsampling. If you're performing subsampling in terms of the validation clients and you have more heterogeneous data, then this is uh, you know, an issue that you would see. All right, and I should say here that 
uh, you know, what we're seeing in terms of the, the, the black lines here, these are sort of the natural partitionings of the, the data sets in terms of their natural heterogeneous form. So we're trying to sort of forcibly make the data set more identically distributed than it is. Uh, but in practice, we're likely to see these issues of heterogeneity show up in practice. Okay, and this is uh, so, so first question there before you move on, like, how do you define the data heterogeneity in this case? Is it like based on labels or something else? So what we're doing is we're taking the, the data here. So it depends on the data set. In terms of CIFAR 10, this is something that people typically manually partition in a, in a heterogeneous way in terms of the labeling. Mm -hmm. In terms of the other three data sets, uh, there's sort of a natural partitioning that's given by the data set itself. So for the feminist data set, we have information about which people actually wrote different digits or letters. So that's being used to figure out you know, what the different clients are. In terms of the Stack Overflow data set and the Reddit data set, again, we have information about you know, uh, who the, the text is coming from, basically. Um, so this can allow us to develop these partitions of the data. So they might not be just in terms of, of label skew. Um, right. They might be in terms of some underlying characteristics of the data. Right. Thanks. Okay. Um, then we look at this issue of systems heterogeneity, and we look at you know what what might be uh, a seemingly sort of adversarial setting, but is actually something that you can see happen a lot in practice, which is that we look at a scenario where there's some correlation between the uh, clients that have more capabilities and perform as part of the training process and the types of clients that perform in the validation procedure. And so what I what I mean by that is that if you imagine that there are certain devices in the network that have better systems capabilities, and those devices maybe have a certain flavor of data, right? So maybe there's data corresponding to, to those devices that all look somewhat similar. What you might see is that the clients that perform as part of the training process, because they're the clients that have you know, better systems capabilities tend to be similar in nature to the clients that you'll see perform in the evaluation process. And we can mimic this issue in the following way. So the way that we're trying to, to see that this could potentially appear is that very simply, we have a sampling bias in these results to sample clients as part of evaluation that have better performance in terms of the, the model that was trained, right? So what, what would happen here is that you might see that there are certain clients that uh, the model is already a very good fit for because those are the types of clients that we typically saw during training. Um, and what we're looking at here is what if we have some sort of sampling bias where we tend to sample the clients that already have very low training loss, okay? Um, so this is, again, this might seem like a sort of adversarial setting and that we're adjusting the, you know, sort of sampling that we're performing of the validation pool, but this is actually something that you could see very naturally occurring in practice. There are certain types of clients that have certain types of data. They also have certain types of systems capabilities. They are more likely to have better network connection, newer phones, uh, more likely to plug their phone into power. Um, and all of these things can just further bias the, the sampling procedure and the sorts of clients that we see, not only at training time, but also at validation time. Okay, so we look at this potential issue of, of bias, um, which again is, is trying to reflect this issue of systems heterogeneity. And what we see is that if you introduce this type of bias, you know, clearly this can sort of exacerbate some of the results that you have from subsampling, because now we're not just performing subsampling, but we're performing a very biased type of subsampling of the clients. And you can see that this can very quickly start to tink the performance of the, the method and of these, you know, these hyperparameter tuning methods, because we, we're not actually getting access to the full client pool at validation time. We're getting access to this very biased information from the client pool. Okay, so this is something, again, that you can see uh, appears across all of the, the data sets that we looked at so in some data sets to, to different degrees based on the amount of bias that we're introducing. Okay, finally, let me talk about this issue of privacy. Um, so the punchline here is that privacy make things, makes things very, very difficult. <laughs> um, so uh, this is something that is well known, I think, in the training setting. So it's very difficult in particular, unless you have very sort of massive federated networks to provide sort of meaningful guarantees in terms of differential privacy when training over that data. Um, you see the same sort of behavior in terms of evaluation. 
So what we did is we looked at preserving differential privacy in terms of the evaluation with different levels of epsilon. So the smaller the epsilon, the more private the results. And what we see is that unless you have a very sort of comically large value of epsilon here, so we're looking at, say, epsilon 100, the, uh, the impact of preserving privacy through differential privacy in terms of evaluation, this really starts to tank the performance of the, the method, right? So we're, we're getting a significant increase in the validation error if we're trying to impose any sort of meaningful guarantees on differential privacy through this evaluation process. And this is, again, something that we see shown across all of the, the, the data sets that we've looked at. Um, so this is one where I think there is probably the biggest gap between what you see in, you know, people developing methods and performing research and then what you see in practice, which is that if we really want to preserve privacy, um, especially, you know, not just in terms of training, but in terms of evaluation, uh, then we really have to sort of make sacrifices in, in terms of what that privacy guarantee is going to be in order to achieve reasonable utility and to perform hyperparameter tuning in a reasonable manner. Okay. Um, so let me let me deliver the rest of the bad news, and then I'm going to talk about some potential solutions here. So uh, just to you know put this all in perspective, one of the the takeaways from this is that if you want to use again these these methods that work quite well in non-federated settings relative to something like random search, what you see in the noiseless setting. So imagine that we didn't have any noise through subsampling or heterogeneity or um, privacy you can see that these methods do perform better than something like random search. What happens though, is that when we're looking at this noisy setting, not even a horribly noisy setting. So we're looking at in this particular experiment, sam subsampling 1% of the clients for validation and using epsilon equals 100, which is again, almost a meaningless <laughs> privacy guarantee. Um, what you see is that the these methods like Bob or hyperband, which perform very well in non-federated settings, can perform catastrophically bad, and in particular, much worse than the simple baseline of random search. Okay, and again, this is something that we, you know, have seen across uh, all of the data sets in our study. So this is something, um, you know, one takeaway from this is that when you're in these very noisy settings, we need to either find ways to modify these state-of-the-art methods from non-federated settings, or perhaps we should just default to these very simple baselines like random search. Okay, so what else can we do given this sort of problematic state of the world? Uh, what else can we do to reliably perform hyperparameter tuning? One thing, and this is sort of interesting to us because this is something that we saw not just the folks at Meta, but a lot of teams in practice were actually doing this. They were using proxy data to perform hyperparameter tuning, um, but maybe didn't have a, a great justification as to why they were using that proxy data. And I think highlighting these issues of noisy evaluation helps to you know, understand and motivate why something like proxy data might be necessary in federated settings. The idea here is if you have, you know, noisy signal coming from your federated network, maybe instead of using that noisy signal to perform validation, it would make more sense to use some server side proxy data. In particular, what we found is that if we, you know, we're setting these specific hyperparameter um, hyperparameters like the learning rate or, you know, various momentum terms for atom or the batch size. What if we looked at finding those hyperparameters, not based on the federated data, but based on some other data living at the server? So for example, for the feminist data set, uh, you could look at using CIFAR 10 to perform hyperparameter tuning. So maybe the CIFAR 10 data set is living at the server and the feminist data set, this is the federated data set that's living at the edge. And what we found, I think this is pretty intuitive, is that you see there actually being a fair bit of correlation between data sets for similar tasks. Right, so CIFAR 10 and fact, both image recognition tasks for feminist and, and C for 10, there's some correlation here in terms of the error of different hyperparameter configurations. And similarly, for these two language tasks, Reddit and Stack Overflow, you see there being some correlation. Okay, and so this gives us some intuition for why this might be reasonable. We looked at the performance of this, 
So for various data sets, we looked at the performance of not using that data set, but using potentially a different data set. So what would be the final error if we use these other proxy data sets for performing hyperparameter tuning? And you see sort of matching the intuition here that you know, data sets that are similar in terms, in terms of the task, like the CIFAR 10 data set in Feminist, you get the best error if you use the actual data set. But as long as the task is similar, you can see that there's actually some transfer here that's happening in terms of using these data sets for validation, which is pretty interesting. Okay, and you know, going back to the previous results, sort of the, the punchline is that this proxy data set can in particular be a reasonable thing to look at when you're in scenarios where you have high amounts of noise. So for example, if you're in a scenario where you might be subsampling the clients and you're in this case trying to provide even a small amount of privacy, it can be better to just use the proxy data set. So for example, for the CFR10 data set, we could use the feminist data set and this achieves lower error than using any, any of the signal coming from the actual CFR10 data set in light of this validation noise. Okay. Um, so let me give some takeaways for this portion of the talk, just to make sure I have a little bit to say here at the end with the, the other component. So the high level takeaways from this work, the, the key things to me. So the, the first thing is that I think this study highlights that um, one, just in the context of hyperparameter tuning, it can be smart when you have this noisy validation signal, which is likely to occur in practice, to use simpler hyperparameter tuning optimization methods. I think there's a question here of, and this is I think an area of interesting open work, whether there are tools or techniques that we could use to better model or adapt to this noisy validation signal and maybe to boost the performance of these other hyperparameter tuning methods. But if we're just using them as is, I think that the takeaway here is to sort of default to these simpler hyperparameter optimization methods like random search, because these other approaches that are adaptively trying to you know, quickly iterate over the hyperparameter search space, they don't work very well when the signal that, we're get, that they're getting to perform that adaptation is very noisy. Okay, there are other takeaways, which you, know, you might not actually have the ability to adjust these parameters, but you know, very clearly, if you have the ability to, you should use more validation clients and you should use a more representative set of clients. So as much as is possible, try to use a large validation signal and try to uh, a, large val a, a large set of validation clients and try to get as representative of, of a signal as possible. So try to address these issues of bias that might be occurring. And if you don't have the ability to, to, do, to do these things, then uh, what we found is that proxy data could potentially be an effective solution. And I think this is another area where there's some interesting open problems to be solved here in terms of making this idea of sort of transferring hyperparameters from one data set to another more rigorous and understanding in what scenarios this can be effective. More generally, one of the, the punchlines here, and this is something that I've seen not just in this work, but we also have you know, several other works looking at federated hyperparameter tuning. Uh, I think it's just worth mentioning this problem is very difficult. Um, and again, this is something that I think is worth pointing out for the field at large, because people often don't think about this problem of noisy validation signal when they're developing new methods for federated learning. Um, and to me, one of the key punchlines is you can, in a research setting, maybe develop a new method that introduces many different hyperparameters, and you can spend a lot of time thinking about how to select those hyperparameters, and you can show results where you have you know, searched over the entire hyperparameter optimization space, maybe with full validation signal. In practice, this is not something that you're, you're going to be able to do very effectively. And so I think this is something to keep in mind for the field of federated learning more generally, which is that simple methods are, you know, they're always a good thing, but especially in light of this issue of noisy validation signal, they can be a particularly important thing to consider for federated settings. Okay. Let me stop here briefly to see if there's any questions on, on this component of the talk. And then I'm just gonna speak very briefly about this issue of evaluating uh, large language models. If there are no questions from the audience, maybe I can again ask a question. I think this is really interesting work. Um, I, this is more of an open question, so perhaps you don't have the answer on that, but I would like to hear your thoughts about this thing um, with proxy data. Like you say that if you have proxy data, it can probably be beneficial to use that in order to optimize the problem that you're trying to solve. Do you have any thoughts about like 
how you should choose your proxy data if you are able to like for example some task similarity metric does that exist or can you like reason about how similar two tasks are to like predict if if your proxy data is even good to use because i can imagine if there is an orthogonal task you're trying to solve the proxy data won't be good right Yes, that's a great question. So there, there's actually some related work on this in the context of pre-training and fine-tuning. There's some work that has been, you know, focused on the problem of if you if you want to create a pre-trained model, how should you think about selecting data for that pre-trained model so it's a good fit for the, right, the model, right. you know, the data that you're going to be fine-tuning on. And I think that that, you know, you could potentially leverage some of the ideas from that work, like at a high level, what you're trying to do is have some measure of the data distribution of the, you know, one data set and make sure it's a good fit for the, the other data. Um, one issue there that I think is worth pointing out is that doing this in a federated setting is pretty difficult in the sense that you assume that the data living at the edge is potentially private, right? Um, and so...